Here I'd like to illustrate the law of one price, which is the first idea we learn in the fixed income series following Bruce Tuckman, topic four, part one of the FRM. This law of one price is something that we rely on subsequently in fixed income. I like to think of it as discount factors do not lie. I'm going to illustrate it concretely by assuming a 4% spot rate. That's a stated or nominal rate. We'll see that if we vary the compound frequency, we can generate different 1.5 year discount factors. These are in red because this is a violation of the law of one price. The law of one price basically says that absent confounding factors, because identical cash flows should sell for the same price, we should only have a single 1.5 year discount factor. The law of one price says that identical cash flows should sell for the same price absent confounding factors. When I think of the law of one price, I think of a statement I learned many years ago in finance that has been useful ever since. And that's right here. Discount factors do not lie. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take an interest rate of 4%. And specifically, this is a spot or zero rate. And let's ask, what is the 1.5 year discount factor? By which I mean... If we receive $1 in 1.5 years in the future, what's the present value or discounted present value today of that $1? If we have a 4% interest rate, that's straightforward, right? We take the one point, we one plus the 4% and we can raise it in this case to negative 1.5 and we get our discount factor. And it's tempting to put a dollar sign here in front of it. It wouldn't be wrong, but by convention, we don't include it. And so then this becomes a simple multiplier we can use on any future cash flow. If that cash flow is 1.5 years in the future, right? There's going to be a, a 0.5, a 1.0, a 2.0. Every different maturity has a different discount factor. And that gives us a curve or discount function. But this is the one at 1.5 years. So it's a multiplier. That means if we're going to receive $100 in 1.5 years, then the idea is we could just take that future value, multiply it by the discount factor. Didn't do that quite right. 100 times the discount factor. And we get the present value is $94.29. Okay, so far good, except for the fact that let me take that same stated or nominal spot rate right? This is really called a stated or nominal rate. And now I'll change the compound frequency to semi-annual with this. And we typically would see this kind of notation. Now I'm specifically saying that the interest rate is 4% per annum with semi-annual compound frequency. And the discount factor, the 1.5 year discount factor in this case is we still take one plus that 4%. We divide by two though. Semi-annual is two periods per year. And so this time we'll raise it to 1.5 years, but we'll multiply by two to be uh, consistent because there were three semi-annual periods in 1.5 years. And I get, you'll notice a different discount factor. So under this discount factor, the present value of $100, I still just use it as a multiplier, is less. It's $94.23. So finally, I'll just do continuous compounding, and that would be indicated with a small cc. So now I am 4% per annum with continuous compounding, and it's very elegant, right? I could just take the rate and multiply it by, or uh, E raised to the negative rate, multiply by the number of years. And in this case, if it's discounted continuously, then I'm going to get an even lower amount. So I get three different present values. And so two observations about this, right? The first is that in, there's a sense in which the stated or nominal rate does lie. I don't mean it lies. I mean, it's not enough information or it's imprecise. And we see this all the time. If I tell you, can you discount for me $100? Uh, 1.5 year from 1.5 years in the future, discounted at 4%, then I've not given you enough information because I didn't give you the compound frequency. The, so that we have three different cases here, all the same stated or nominal rate of 4%. 
but they imply different present values. So in that sense, the stated or nominal spot rate sort of lies. I really mean it's incomplete until we provide the compound frequency. The discount factor, on the other hand, already accounts for that, or imp it impounds the compound frequency, is how I think of it. This 0.9418, if that's the 1.5 year discount factor, it's reliable as a multiplier, and you can see here, it incorporated already the relevant compound frequency. So that's the sense in which we mean discount factors do not lie. The stated or nominal rate, however, is incomplete unless we specify the compound frequency. The second thing, second observation, is the law of one price. Again, what I said is identical cash flows should all sell for the same price. In all cases, this is $100 to be received in 1.5 years simple lump sum, one cash flow. These are identical cash flows. They, the law of one price says that this situation does not exist. After all, if it did, there would be an arbitrage opportunity. So the law of one price release is saying that there should only be one discount factor at this maturity. So let's say that it's this one, the um, 0.9418 then what we really mean is that this nominal rate, if we're going to use annual compound frequency, it's the value that should change. And in this case, then, if I do the translation, all I need to really do is uh, E raised to the 4% and subtract 1. I lost my formatting for some reason. And then I get 4.08. And I'm going to also do that for semi-annual. So I'll take the uh, E raised to the 4%. But this time I'll divide by 2, subtract 1, and then I need to um, multiply that whole amount by 2. So I've translated now the annual compound frequency and the semi-annual compound frequency to adjust the stated or nominal rates so that my discount factors match. And really, this would be enforcement of the law of one price, so I avoid the arbitrage opportunities. And I... Do you want to just finally say before I show you the Tuckman exhibit, I had a, a caveat there and a qualifier in that, and that is absent confounding factors. And that's really not a by the way, that's essential, right? Because really in practice, when we use this spot rate, we typically mean a theoretical risk-free spot rate as part of a theoretical risk-free spot rate curve. Sometimes it's even called the theoretical treasury spot rate curve. So we're trying to get a risk-free number. And so absent confounding factors includes credit risk, right? We would have different values here if, we're, if we wanted to incorporate credit risk. This happens to include risk-free. This happens to assume risk-free. That's not the only confound factors. Confound factors can be fundamental or technical. Another fundamental would be taxes or taxation. We're not accounting for that here. Technical are really important and they include liquidity and supply and demand. So those confounding factors in practice do introduce distortions. So it's a huge simplifying assumption to say absent confounding factors. But if we're willing to do that, and then this is a theoretical risk-free spot rate, then the law of one price says that we should only have one discount factor at each maturity. So then I go to a blend of Tuckman's tables 1.2 and 1.3 if you're tracking me with Bruce Tuckman's text. And I've just made two changes here. Cosmetically, I've moved the date to May 28, 2019, just to give this an updated feel. So we'll assume that's today. And then I've taken those coupons and rounded them off to make the example easier to follow. Otherwise, this is today, and what we have are a set or series of five bonds, each with different maturities going out on the curve, a six-month bond, a one-year bond, all the way out to two-and-a-half-year bond. And we observe the prices, right? So we're not computing the theoretical bond prices here. A key here is that we observe traded prices. So these are inputs for us, and we use those prices to infer the discount function according to the law of one price. The discount function is just the name for 
the set or series of discount factors. So we have a different discount factor at each maturity along the curve. So if we take the first bond here, it's a six month bond. So we only have a single cash flow and we observe a price of $100.40. So inferring the six month discount factor is very straightforward because we know that there, the only cash flow here is going to be $101 to be received in six months, right? If that's the par or face value of 100 plus the final coupon, which is one half of the 2%. Okay, and these are semi-annual pay bonds. So that's the final, the only cash flow to be received in six months, such that we know if we multiplied it by the six month discount factor, we should get the price. So we assume these prices aren't trading rich or trading cheap, as they say. You can see this is very straightforward to infer then the six month discount factor as the price that we observe divided by the final cash flow, 1010, okay? So I'll just do that here and calculate the discount, the six month discount factor by taking that price, dividing by the final cash flow. So we have 0 0.99406 and the law of one price says that's it. And in fact, we're gonna use that now call this bootstrapping to get the one year discount factor that otherwise we couldn't get unless we had this one, this six month discount factor. And really you can see implicitly we're, we're leaning on that law of one price. So this one year discount factor, how would we get that? Well, this one year bond has two cash flows. The first cash flow is the coupon in six months, $2.50. That's half of the 5%. And if we want to discount it to today, right, we multiply it by the six month discount factor. And then we're going to add the final cash flow, which is going to be 10250. Again, par plus the final coupon. And if we multiply that by the discount factor, we should get the price of 10320. And that means that. The one year discount factor, if I just want to solve for that, right, is going to be one year discount factor is going to be the price that I observe minus $2.50 coupon multiplied by the six month discount factor. And I'm just going to divide out that final cash flow, 10250. That formula for me gets me the one year discount factor. And you can see that I have the six month discount factor because that was inferred from the price of the six month bond. So I have what I need, but I did need that. And I do need to depend on the fact that for this bond's coupon, the same discount factor applies and that's the law of one price. So I go, then if I go to do that, right, I take the price here, I subtract the coupon of $2.50 multiplied by this discount factor, and I divide that quantity by the 10250, and I get the one year discount factor. And so I won't do the same algebra on the next one, but uh, we can just extend the pattern. Now I want the 1.5 year discount factor, and to get that, I'm gonna take this price, and I'm gonna subtract this bond's coupon, which is $3, half of the 6%. That first coupon needs to use the six month discount factor. I'm gonna subtract the next coupon. It's gonna use the one year discount factor. And this quantity is going to be divided by the final cash flow. In this case, 100 par plus the final coupon of $3. And I get the 1.5 year discount factor and you can tell I've done these a lot as I've built a lot of these spreadsheets. So this is my discount factor and I can keep extending that and I get the discount function. This bootstrapping in each case relies on the fact that each of these bonds is a set of coupon cash flows before the last one. And so all of the coupons that are paid in six months for all of these bonds 
utilize the same discount factor because we're assuming the law of one price that they all need to use the same discount factor absent those confounding factors, which are either fundamental or technical, liquidity and supply and demand being the most important confounding factors. Okay, so that's law of one price and also how we bootstrap discount factors. If the video is helpful, please subscribe to the channel so you get notified of the next one. And this is part of a series in fixed income, according to Bruce Tuckman in part one, topic four of the FRM.